uh, lawyer at the Family Law Project. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and tuning in so quickly. And today, the webinar, what we're going to talk about is separation and property division and the first steps and where to start, because this is a really um, often when people separate, they just don't know where to start. So really quickly in terms of housekeeping, because we've got people that have joined us live today and we also will have people watching this back, for example, on YouTube. So I have um, our director, Elham Rubber, is co-hosting today and she'll be in the chat box. So there'll be polls and so on for you to complete. But if you can say hello in the chat box, introduce yourself, let you know, let us know where you're from. And just waiting to hear from Elham there in the chat box as well, so that I know that you can all hear me okay. And perhaps if someone else can pop in the chat box that you can hear me okay. So what this is, is um, a, a one hour seminar. I'll, I'm going to avoid the legalese today. The type of people we've got joining us are people such as those who have separated Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> um, people who've separated, we have um, service providers that work in the family law space. So really love to hear from you, where you're from, and also legal advisors such as Alicia from my office, who's just popped in the chat box. So just so you know, I, I will avoid legalese, but there's a real fine balance to talking to people who have separated and talking to legal advisors. So avoiding the legalese, but there'll be references to case law um, throughout and the lawyers can go off, off and, and read them. Alrighty, so that's just a slide about us at the Family Law Project. I've got away with words. So because we are talking to a lot of people who've separated today, and I think that will be the large majority that watch the replay as well, um, I will, I will use the expression your ex-partner, so just keep that in mind if you are a legal advisor or a service provider. When I refer to the Act, I'm referring to the Family Law Act, okay, and most of, the juris, most of Australia is covered by the Family Law Act, a little bit of an exception with Western Australia, but um, generally speaking, everywhere in Australia, the, the principles are the same. So what we're going to cover today we're going to talk about the types of relationships that are protected or that do fall subject to property settlements. We'll discuss what exactly a property settlement is, because that's a good starting point, right? We will talk about time limits and immediate practical steps that you can take post-separation. So that will be things such as, you know, who stays in the home, who pays the mortgage and those sort of more immediate questions. We'll discuss injunctions and caveats. And we're also going to look at what we as lawyers call the four-step process. And essentially that sets out as it's, it's the legislation, but it, we use it as a guide to divide property regardless of if your matter is in court or if your matter um, is being negotiated out, outside of court, we always still use that four-step process as a guide. And just checking, Alicia, can you use the chat box just to let me know that you can still hear me? And perhaps put in the chat box as well for people to use Chrome if they're having any issues. There's not that many comments in the chat box compared to normal. Alrighty, so... Thanks, Alicia. So in terms of what is a relationship, these are the, the two types of relationships where the court has jurisdictional power to make orders. And obviously, if you're married, that's going to be, that's pretty straightforward. The other type of relationship where you have the protection of the family law and for property division is when you're a de facto, in a de facto relationship and again, I've put the sections of the Act there for legal advisors to have a good read of it. Very simply speaking, essentially, generally, if you've had two years, thanks, Alicia, if you've had two years um, living together in a de facto type relationship or a child, then, then you will fall under this protection of the court. 
sorry, what is a property settlement? Well, I'm going to say at the outset, and I don't mean to sound like a typical lawyer when I say this, but it is complicated. And you'll see why as I roll through these slides, you will see why it is a bit complicated. It's essentially an alteration of an existing property entitlement. And a property settlement will set out exactly what's going to happen to property upon your separation. That's probably the simplest way to word it. And I know that sounds like a really simple concept, but it's just so important that you know what a property settlement is. And the Family Law Act, I've just popped there for the, the legal advisors, Section 81 has this what we call a clean break principle, because it's really important from the court's perspective to extingu extinguish that economic financial relationship between the parties. And if you continue to have joint ownership of property without resolving your property settlement, then it can cause all sorts of issues in the future. Going to debunk a few myths today. So one of those myths is, and I've just put it up on the slide here, so I've got lots of slides going through and just a reminder that um, to keep your eyes on the slides. So this myth, I have to wait until I'm divorced to start my property settlement, to commence my property settlement. That is, that is a myth. It's just that, okay? And you, you don't have to wait until you're divorced to start your property settlement. And in fact, you can't get divorced if you're married, you can't get divorced until you've been separated for a year. So um, there's nothing precluding you from getting things started straight away. And some people never get divorced. So you can definitely start straight away. And um, you can deal with parenting matters and property matters at the same time, but you don't have to wait until you've sorted out your parenting matter or your divorce matter to start your property settlement. So it's very much seen as a separate part of your family law settlement. And um, for most people, it really should start as, as soon as possible, okay? Because I've just put the picture up there of the, of the clock. The, the time is ticking. And generally speaking, for most people, it will be in your interest to ensure that you start as soon as possible. You wanna know your time limits and um, Time limits are super important. So it's really critical. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the time limit is to initiate proceedings in the court and most matters will resolve out of the court, but you always want the court as a fallback position and you don't want to run out of time so that that's precluded as an option for you. So I'll just pull up the next slide. Let's have a look. There we go. So time limits in terms of if you are relying on the court is 12 months after a divorce order. So if you get your divorce order and you've you've waited longer than 12 months to then resolve your property settlement and if you need the court, you might find yourself in a bit of a bother because you then need permission or leave from the court, permission from the court to continue with that process. With de facto couples, the, the time limit there is two years from the date of separation. So in those circumstances, you have two years from the date of separation to resolve your property matter. And if you need to use the court, then you've only got two years um, in order to do so. And I've, I have had matters that have been out of time. And... Um, Sorry, I'm just changing the layout of the slides here. There we go, I'm back. <laughs> I have had matters that have been out of time. I had a client, for example, and her um, divorce had gone through some 20 or so years prior, very long time ago. And she was in a position where she'd relied on the, the verbal assurance of her ex-husband that she would be able to stay living in the property that was in his sole name but we fast forward 20 years later and he, he reneged on that agreement and she relied on the family law court to try and get some protection there. Unfortunately, she was not successful and she didn't get that leave or permission to even go through that process. So it, it's just another example of why those time limits are so important. 
Time limits can work in your favour though. Um, if property is largely in your sole name, so for example, if you do have real estate in your sole name or if you've got super, which will always be in your sole name, if, if, if you're aware that the majority of assets are in your sole name, then there might be some benefit to doing nothing except perhaps apply for the divorce so that time starts ticking. If you're de facto, you might not, it might not be in your interest to do anything if you hold the majority of the property so that things can start ticking over in terms of that time limit. Likewise, if your ex-partner holds majority of the assets, there's going to be some um, real issues and concerns for you so as to ensure that you are acting on that as soon as possible. You don't want to be in a position where you're running out of time and you, you can't make a claim to that property. So if the time limit's approaching and things have not yet been resolved, then it's probably a good idea to do what's called a preservation application where you can do a quick application to the court so as to protect your interest. So just moving on to the next slide. How are you going there, Alicia? Can you still hear me okay? Thanks, Alicia. So before you leave, this, if you're in a, an, a, a really good position in that you know before separation that you're going to be leaving and not, not a lot of people are in this sort of situation, but if you are in a situation where you know that um, your ex-partner's leaving or you're going to be leaving, really take some time and check some boxes to ensure that certain things are done. So you want to get legal advice. I'm always going to say that. You want to take copies of documents, so including your financial documents and your partner or ex-partner's documents. Take photographs of anything that's of value that you feel that you might be leaving behind or your ex-partner might be taking. And I'm talking about real significant things of value. You don't have to take photographs of the whole household contents. Um, before you leave or before your ex-partner leaves, before you even get to that point, one of the things that you should do if it's safe to do so is really have that conversation with your, your partner or ex-partner about your living arrangements and what those living arrangements might be. The other thing that's super important is to ascertain, well, what's important to you? Because you'd be perhaps surprised, perhaps not surprised, but we do have so many clients come to us and in this sort of initial stage of separation, they really just don't know where to start. And they haven't actually turned their mind to what's important to them. So think about what is important to you in terms of interim and, and long-term goals or outcomes. So the sort of things that might be important is, is keeping the family home super important to you? If so, can you do so? Have you made those inquiries to see how much you can refinance? Is getting a cash payment from your ex-partner um, necessary or important to you to be able to set up a new home, a new to buy a new house or, or, or live somewhere else? And if so, how much do you think that is? Is it important to you, for example, to retain your super? For some people, that's really important, depending on their age as well. It might affect their retirement. Are the living arrangements for the children important for you? So every matter is unique, but what I would suggest is most people will have like a not neg, a not negotiable. And that's just really, really important to turn your mind to that. I'm just going to take a cup of tea. So initial steps. The other thing that we need to consider at this point is, is the family home? Who's going to stay there and try and agree on that if it's safe to do so? It's a really common question, who gets to stay in the family home? There's no rules about this. The, the law is not necessarily going to help you in that respect. 
But the sort of things that you want to consider is, well, who's going to be the parent who is having majority of care of the children? And is it appropriate for the children to remain living in the family home, for example? The other thing that you might want to consider and you should consider is, um, well, looking forward, who do we think is going to remain in the family home on a long on a long term basis? Who's the person who wants wants the house? If either you might not, who's the person who can probably afford to do so based on their income and position, or is there one party where it's just not going to be feasible for them to ultimately take over the mortgage and the property? If there are issues of financial hardship. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, and I just want to get this point in, that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that you're going to have to leave the property because, you know, there, there's certain things that you can get such as sole occupancy order or by agreement that you remain living there. And if there are issues around your safety, then we can look at things such as um, intervention orders as well might be relevant for you. But definitely, if you can, if it's not too late to do so, get that advice before you leave the house. One of the big myths that we hear, and I see all over social media, is once you leave the property, you lose your entitlement to that property. I can really easily nip that in the bud because that's that's simply not true, okay? <laughs> um, just because you leave the property does not mean that you forfeit your interest in that property. So yeah, just think about what's important to you. And I think if you've got the benefit of being able to do that initially, then that's really important. So just going back to first steps when you do first separate, one of the other things to know is that it's not unreasonable for you both to stay living separated, but together under the same roof initially when you separate particularly if both names are on the title and you both agree to do that and it's safe to do so, okay? If you do that, though, one really strong tip is even if you're living together but separately, ensure that you start the division of your, of your financials, separate your bank accounts and make it really clear that although you're living together, you have separated. And one of the other questions we get is around the mortgage and around bills and who pays those when you separate. Well, again, each matter is different. And ideally, if you can agree about that, then that will be the best outcome. Often we see the person who does stay at the home is the person who takes over the mortgage. But that's uh, particularly when the person who's left is, is making their own financial payments towards another mortgage or another rent and so on. But it's, that's not always the case. If your mortgage is in joint names, then remember, it's going to remain a joint debt and a joint responsibility. So you really want to ensure that you're not defaulting in the payments. And it's quite common um, for, for clients of ours to approach the bank and just say, look, we're having a bit of um, financial difficulty and or we've separated and you put a pause on mortgage repayments for a short period of time. So that takes us to the next slide. And essentially, I want to talk about if you've got concerns about the conduct or bad behaviour of your, of your ex-partner. So we just spoke about really quickly about mortgages. I want to um, really give this advice because it's so important that when you do separate, one of the first things you should do is if your mortgage has a redraw facility, ensure that joint signatories are required for that. So in other words, your ex-partner can't just draw funds on that because we do see that quite a lot, all right? Um, super, super important. The other thing that you can look at initially if you've got concerns for your ex-partner's conduct or bad behaviour are things such as injunctions. And I've put the reference there to the Family Law Act for the legal advisors. Really good to refresh yourself with that section 114 of the Act because it's a, a good timely reminder, I think, to know that, look, if you've got injunctions for personal protection, 
under the, the court can give you those injunctions for your own personal protection. But the other thing the court has power to do or jurisdiction to do is make injunctions to prevent your ex-partner from selling property or, um, you know, or depleting the asset pool. So that's really important to keep in mind that there's that jurisdiction to do that, to give the, to protect the asset pool, essentially. If you've got um, any property that's in your ex-partner's sole name and you've got concerns that they might sell or transfer that without your consent, then you really should get some legal advice around whether it's appropriate to lodge a caveat on that certificate of title. And what that will essentially do is it will preclude your ex-partner from selling or transferring that property without your consent. It also makes it less likely for your ex-partner to be able to put a any further mortgages on that property, excuse me, as well. So each state differs with respect to caveats and you must show that you've got an interest in the land. Um, but really, really important to keep that in mind. So next steps when you're separating. What I would suggest you start doing as soon as possible is to really get organised and don't be one of those clients, I've put the picture there, don't be one of those clients that comes to us with the Woolworths bag of all your financial particulars all messed up in the Woolies bag. That's not helpful for, for us or for you. So you need to put on your business hat and start being as organised as possible. I'd also suggest setting up a separate email address to deal with all things family law. What I've also popped there on the slide is around password protection. And I really recommend that you change your email passwords and change all your passwords, such as things like the Apple ID and all the other cloud type. I don't know what they're called even, but all your passwords, make sure you get on to changing them. Then get on to super. And again, a couple of simple things that you can do even yourself without a lawyer when you initially separate to really protect your interest. So change your nominated beneficiary. Change your nominated beneficiary. Honestly, so many clients come to us years after separation and this has been an oversight or they weren't aware that they had to do that because the separation in itself won't give you that protection. So that's really, really super important. The other thing, your binding death nomination as well, or any life insurance, for example, check with the, the super trustee directly and get all that changed. Really briefly, because I've done a whole other webinar on this topic and I'm not going to bang on about this, <laughs> but super important that you update your will. Separation from your spouse or your de facto partner does not revoke a previous will. And if you don't have a will in place, then the law of your state's basically going to be able to determine how your assets are distributed, who your executor is, and yeah, like I said, who your beneficiaries are. Separation in, in itself is not going to give you that protection you need. Don't do a DIY will kit. I've, again, I've done a, another session on that. We've got an ebook on that if you want to read that. But I think it's super important, and I'll, I'll just read this. And this is really hones in that the separation itself and, and a state law, an estranged spouse will be treated the same as a happily married spouse in most states. So again, just because you've separated doesn't mean that you've got that protection that you need. So... What we've discussed already is sort of immediate things to consider when you first separate, post-separation, the sort of, yeah, immediate, more urgent sort of things, I guess, and getting yourself in order. But in order to give you context, um, you really need to know how, how the law is going to determine your property division. And first and foremost, well, what is property? That's <laughs> what is property? Because until we cover what is property, well, it's all a bit of a bit irrelevant, isn't it? So I'll just pull up the next slide. Uh, 
What is property? All set out in the Family Law Act. It's going to include all assets that are in sole names or joint names. Going to include things such as uh, real estate, cars, cash, money in bank accounts, shares, household content, contents, trusts and business um, businesses. Okay, so it's basically it's a very very broad definition. It includes every possible interest a person can have and doesn't matter how that property interest was acquired. So any sort of property you can think of will probably form part of the asset pool. Here's a common question we get. What about overseas property? Overseas property, um, to get technical, the orders that are made by a property agreement or court orders for property, they're called orders that are made in personam, in personam. And essentially what that means is that the orders are made against the parties and not against the property. So the court's got jurisdiction to make orders for overseas property and the legal advisors watching along or watching back, I'd refer to section 31.2 of the Family Law Act, 31.2. I didn't put that on the slide, but just write down section 31.2. Have a read back about that. And that just confirms that the court's got jurisdiction to make orders about overseas property. The issue, though, is enforcement because that's where the jurisdiction essentially ends. So it's really hard to enforce orders about overseas property if they're not complied with. What you need to know, though, is that they do form part of the asset pool. You do have a duty to disclose overseas assets. And um, if you fail to disclose overseas assets and that your ex-partner finds out later, you could find everything reopen again. So that's just really important to know. Alrighty, I'm just going to take a, another a sip of tea. I'm talking too much. <laughs> I've just pulled up the next slide for you as well. And what I've suggested here is one of the things that you can do post-separation in terms of putting together all of the, the property and all of the assets is put together a chronology. And a chronology is going to be a list of the, all the assets that you've brought into the relationship, um, debt or liabilities, an estimate of the values of, of the property, any windfalls and inheritances, debts or liabilities, financial resources, and also key dates. Now, another myth that sort of gives, gives us some context and brings us brings us into the next part of the webinar nicely, I think, is this myth that there will be a 50-50 or an equal division of the asset pool. So that is a myth, okay? It's a really, really common myth. So many clients think there's so many people speaking on the internet, social media are of this view about this whole 50-50 and 50-50 um, fairness and 50-50 division. But it's not true. It's more complicated than that. Of course it is. <laughs> the, the law doesn't necessarily make it easy for us to advise clients or for clients to navigate the system themselves. But I can tell you that that is a myth around the 50-50 division of the complex, uh, division of the property. What we use as the guide is the Family Law Act. And doesn't matter how you're resolving your property settlement, if you're negotiating, if it's amicable, all the way through to court, you're going to use this as your guide. And we call it the four-step process. For any legal advisors watching, you you should be across the matter of Stamford, which is a 2012 high court case, which again makes things a little bit more complex. But <laughs> if you've not read that case as a legal advisor, yeah. you need to. And yeah, that's just really recommended for you. For everyone else, we'll call it the four-step process. And there's four steps involved when you determine how property should be divided as opposed to that myth of the 50-50 division. 
the four step process it's not not a mathematical it's not a mathematical um sort of exercise all right and i'm just going to move the screen again the step one identify an as uh, the asset pool so what we want to do first up is quantify the asset pool or establish exactly what the asset pool is and part of that and part of your obligations and your ex-partner's obligations is to provide full and frank disclosure and, and document exchange. And the first step is to identify, well, what is all the assets, but also to value them. And the value of the assets is going to be either what is valued or what is agreed, because you and your ex-partner can agree to place a value on any amount, on any piece of um, property, but you really, the key is as agreed. If, for example, homes or real estate's not agreed, often what we find is the parties might get a few appraisals from real estate agents and take the, agree to take the median midpoint of that. It, the fullback position and always best practice is a licensed valuation, but that comes at a cost. But Essentially or ultimately, if there's no agreement, that is what's going to have to be done. But you go through that process for every every asset, okay? So that's part of step one of identifying the asset pool. I've just popped on the slides there, inheritances. Really important to know that inheritances do form part of the asset pool. And this is a bit of a another myth and, you know, that property or property that's been inherited doesn't form part of the asset pool because it's an inheritance and that, you know, it should be quarantined. That's not actually correct. It does form part of the asset pool if it's already been received. So if it's not already been received, and I've put the case law there, the relevant case law for legal advisors to watch, but if it's not already agree, uh, received, it's not going to form part of the asset pool, but it still will be considered Okay, but certainly and with absolute clarity, if, if an inheritance has been received during the relationship, then it does form part of the asset pool. There's a case of Missile and Missile, M-I-S-T-L-E. It's a two 2010 case. And that was, I'm going to go really brief, don't worry, I promised I'd avoid the legalese. But just to give you an interesting example, 2010 case, 23-year relationship, both parties were doctors the asset pool was 4.2 million at the time of separation. Subsequent to the separation, the husband inherited $9.5 million. So this was a um, an asset or the money, because money's an asset, that was inherited post-separation. So whilst it didn't form part of the asset pool, it was still considered um, in the overall property division. Now, the wife didn't get half of that. For complex legal reasons, but it still was an asset that was considered. So I really recommend the legal advisors read that Singerson and Jones case that I've referenced down there. Lotto wins. I had one of these matters actually. Um, when I was working, when I was working in Port Pirie, one as a junior lawyer. In South Australia, one of my clients had separated and subsequently one of them, I can't remember if it was my client or the ex-husband, had a big lotto win and it caused all sorts of problems because they hadn't finalised their property settlement yet. But with lotto wins, similar to inheritances, right? So if it was received during the relationship, then it will be considered an asset of the relationship if it's post-separation, then it's not going to be an asset of the relationship, but it's still going to have some sort of consideration. And the case there for the lawyers that I've popped on the bottom of the slide, that was also a really, it's a well-known case in family law. Most lawyers, family lawyers will know about it, but that's another example of where one of the parties had a $6 million lotto win post-separation. So, it was considered to a certain extent in the property division. So what my point is there, I guess, is that in order to protect 
any future lotto win, which fingers crossed might happen to us, or any future inheritance, it's there's another reason why it's so important to formalise your property settlement so that there can't be any future claims to that. So back to, well, what is property settlement or what is what is property? Next type of property that comes up a little bit, <laughs> um, I do like this slide, but I'm a bit biased. This is my uh, pug, one of my pugs, Philip. He thinks he's human, but he's actually my property. He, um, he would not form part of my property settlement if I separated from my husband. And the court would be really reluctant to make any orders about any animal. And likewise, it's very rare that you'd be able to include any animal in any of your property agreements outside of court. So what else is property? Super, superannuation. Superannuation forms part of the asset pool and it's available to be split if there's over $5,000. Um, if there's less than that amount, then it can't be divided. But certainly some people, again, think, you know, my super's mine, his super's his, her super's hers. But actually super does form part of the asset pool. And the court will consider making a splitting order if it means, for example, that the primary carer of a child can remain living in the matrimonial home and they make, for example, a, a super split in the other party's favour because they can't afford a large cash payment. When we're looking at the asset pool, we also need to consider the liabilities because, of you know, you can't just exclude assets and not consider what the debts are of the relationship. So I've just popped on the slide there various examples of what liabilities might be and the liabilities that should be considered. Um, again, sole or joint names. So it's similar to super, for example. So it's irrelevant if a liability is in someone's sole name. It's still a liability that needs to be considered within the context of the property division. Mortgage loans, personal loans, HEX or HELP or whatever it's called these days, credit card debts, any potential capital gains tax and ATO debt. So I've put their personal loans and that sort of rolls into this potential debt, which is we see this quite a lot actually. We've got a few clients that we're working through these issues at the moment with. It's not uncommon for family to gift money to their children during a relationship and it's not uncommon for families to loan monies to family members as well. So this issue often comes up through clients is they'll say, oh, look, you know, I received $50,000 from my parents and that was a um, that was a loan and there is all intention that that needs to be repaid to my parents. So that's going to become a liability of the relationship. Whereas the other partner might say, well, no, actually that was a, there's, there was never any intention for that to be repaid. That's actually a gift and therefore forms part of the asset pool. So the sort of things that you'd want to look at in those sort of situations is, well, was there a loan agreement, first of all? I can tell you often not, <laughs> more often not than there is. Were there any repayments to show that, yes, it was a loan? Do we have bank statements, for example, with regular payments? And what was the genuine intention? So really important to work out if it was a gift or a loan. If it was a loan, then it will be a liability of the relationship. So we've just gone through Step one, I guess, of the four-step process, into, and I've put the slide up again in terms of identifying the asset pool and valuing the asset pool. The next thing that we need to consider, number two, is contributions. So what are contributions? Well, they can be um, financial, non-financial, and these are the contributions that the parties have made during the relationship. So financial, non-financial, gifts or inheritances, 
We also look at previous assets and we call this a springboard because if you've brought in a previous asset to the relationship, that can really act as a financial springboard to improve the party's financial position. And we look at any other monies that have come in during the relationship as well. So we spoke before about inheritances, injury claims, redundancies, and so on. I also like this next slide um, because it's something that lawyers were not, not meant to say very often. It's a rule of thumb. Generally speaking, though, as a rule of thumb, <laughs> um, long marriages or long relationships we're, we're, we're less likely to look at contributions as, a, as a, a big factor in determining the property division. It's going to be less relevant. It's going to be less relevant, for example, than a short relationship when there's been direct financial contributions to the property. That's when they're going to be considered of greater importance, especially in those shorter relationships if there were no children. Okay, next myth. Any gift or inheritance received is kept separate from the joint asset pool. Um, gifts and inheritance can swing the contribution in favour of the person who's received them, but it's a myth that they're, they're going to be quarantined absolutely from the asset pool. There's no rule that they can be excluded. So following on from contributions, we'll talk about non-financial contributions and what does that mean? And I've put one of the, um, I think it's Walters and Durek, yeah, 1995 case there for the legal advisors watching. That's a really interesting case to read. When we're talking about non-financial contributions, the sort of thing the court will consider are things like homemaking and raising of children improvements to the, the home or property or, or renovations, and also things such as managing investment properties. It's very clear though, and the next slide and case, this is one of the rare cases that I've actually quoted in the slides, but it's, it, it's very clear through case law that your contributions as homemaker and rearing children will be taken into consideration. And it's also recognised that often people put their own employment and career on hold so as to rear children. So this next slide is a 2002 case of Figgins. And I'll just read that. Marriage is and should be regarded as a genuine partnership to which each brings different gifts. The fact that one is productive of money in large quantities is no reason to disadvantage the other. So that's that's a good example of a case case law that made it really clear that um, homemaker needs to be considered. I've also put in this case of Fields and Smith, which is a good example of special skills. And again, you know, being a bit of a, a family lawyer nerd, but it is a really interesting case to read. And in that case, it was a long 29 year marriage uh, parties were in their 50s when they separated. Children were of adult age. And at the time of trial, the house was worth 10 mil and the husband's business was worth $30 million. And the husband was a driving force for a construction business in the Gold Coast. So it was a really specific skill um, that enabled him to really build that business and really build the, you know, the asset pool. But in that case, he, there was a 60-40 favour in favour of the husband, which he appealed, saying, look, more should have been considered. But he was not successful in that. And um, that special skill category can be a really difficult one to, to really get up on. So at this point, I'm just changing my slide again. At this point, I'm not sure, I hope I haven't left you more confused, if not feeling lucky, and that takes me to my next slide, feeling lucky. You can see how complex it is though. This, in terms of being lucky, this just goes into everything that I've just talked about in terms of contributions and what this 2016 case said is that contributions are the product of many things. Talent, 
industry, selfish, selflessness, and indeed luck. So we can see there the, the court's view that, I mean, often we take financial risk together as a partnership and there is a lot of luck involved in that respect. What do you do if there's wasteful or bad behaviour of your ex-partner? This is another common question. So we'll get clients coming into us and they'll say, oh, you know, my ex, she was an alcoholic, she was a gambler, um, he went on overseas holidays and was living it up and really depleted the asset pool, the behaviour, the conduct was really bad or continues to be bad. Cheating, moral moral wrongs are irrelevant from the, the law's perspective. It might be interesting for us to know and give us some context of how we're going to negotiate your property settlement, but um, the court's not too concerned if your ex-wife was cheating on you. Bad investment decisions during the relationship, generally speaking, will be considered a shared a shared um, um, investment, I guess, or, you know, the key word for bad and wasteful behaviour is whether it's been deliberate. So here we go. Oh, here we go next. The slide, wasteful behaviour. Those two cases I've popped there. The first one was an example of the husband gambling some two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, and it was found to be in no way proportionate to their previous lifestyle. So that was definitely an example of wasteful wastefulness. The second case there of Karen. That's where the full court. Um, upheld a decision that the husband had wasted away the value of the matrimonial property because at the time of separation it was worth over $500,000 and at the time of trial due to the husband's, I don't know what he did to that property actually, but it had been reduced to less than $300,000 and it was found to be a direct result of his deliberate conduct. So step four process again, I've, I've repeated or I've gone through step one and two and step one and two are sort of the, the, the more detailed slides. The rest will go through much more quickly. But number three is future needs. And this, again, is something that needs to be considered when you're negotiating your property settlement or um, something that the court will consider if your matter is before the court. So what is future needs? If one party has greater future needs, then they're going to receive a percentage adjustment in their favour. So we're really looking to the future. And the types of things that will be considered, I've popped them up, are things like health, age or age difference, income and earning capacity, who's got the care of the children, is anyone retaining an asset that's going to have a capital gains tax event? And is anyone likely to receive a, a prospective family inheritance? I'll just pause at this point just to make mention that spousal maintenance in Australia is really rare. We don't see it very often. And if you're negotiating privately or through court, we really don't see much in terms of orders for spousal maintenance and we try and ensure that everything's already taken care of and that the future needs of the parties is already taken care of. I do like this slide, so oh, no, not of me. <laughs> I'll just reduce myself and enlarge this one. So life expectancy can work against you, although I suspect these this couple might have had a prenup. The final step that we look at is step four, is whether the overall assess is it's an overall assessment essentially of whether the agreement reached is just and equitable. And how does the court do that? Well, I've, I've put there it's not fair or is it? It's it's the court has quite broad um, jurisdiction, I guess, it, to make discretionary orders that that judge thinks is fair. So what you might think is fair and what someone else might think is fair 
is very subjective. <laughs> so recap there of the four the four steps that we've spoken about and Stanford, of course, for the uh, for lawyers to to make sure they read if they haven't already. So we've spoken about how what is property, how the court loosely determines a property settlement. I want to touch on really briefly for a few minutes the importance of formalising and why would you? Because it's so important. It's so important to have a clean break to get on with your life so there's no risk later of, of your ex-partner coming back, I guess. There's also you don't want to leave yourself open for future action or a claim. And there can also be the crossover of a state law. And if you've not resolved your family law matter, you can see that your estate might be challenged by your ex-spouse or ex-partner as well. So that case that I've put there of Mackenzie is super interesting. Um, the, there'd been an 18-year separation, but the property settlement hadn't been formalised. So that was challenged via a state law. I, that's a really interesting case to read. The other reasons that you might and should, I would say should formalise your property agreement is to ensure no stamp duty is payable on any transfer of property. For capital gains tax relief, you get financial advice about that, obviously. Super splitting actually needs a formal agreement. You can't just write to the super trustee and say, hey, um, my ex-wife is giving me 20 grand of super. Can you just transfer it over? It doesn't work like that. So the trustee is quite specific and direct around what they need to approve that and they need to approve it first. Um, and to ensure that the agreement's not challenged. So don't do this. There's, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of incentive. And as I wrap up the webinar, I'm mindful of the time and thanks for those who've stayed on. Um, and I can see one of the offers has been launched in the chat box for anyone who wants to have a chat to one of our lawyers about their property settlement, just click on that link in the offer. What I'm going to talk about in the next webinar, because I'm mindful of the time and we haven't actually covered how to formalise the agreement. So the next webinar, I'm going to talk about avoiding court, which is nine times out of 10, what we would always advise clients, avoid court if you can. No one comes out of court saying to me, oh, that was a, you know, no one comes out of court saying to me, oh, that was a pleasant experience. That's just, that doesn't happen. Um, we're going to talk about family dispute resolution and mediation. Lawyer-assisted me mediation will discuss consent minutes of order, binding financial agreements, and also talk about court and how the court, the court process, if you unfortunately have to get to that process. So that's what we'll talk about next time. Just Yep, so 30-second recap. I gave myself a time limit there. <laughs> what we've spoken about today is the types of relationships. What is a property settlement? We've spoken about time limits. I've given you hopefully some helpful immediate practical tips that you can and steps that you can take injunctions and caveats and also the four-step process and what the law says and why that's relevant to consider no matter how you're negotiating or getting or reaching your property settlement please remember that every matter is unique and every matter is going to be different so that legal advice is super important the, I can see the slides just popped up in the chat box as well, the, um, the handout for today. So if that's useful for anybody, grab that and, and you know, go your heart out. <laughs> um, the handout's there. If you'd like to chat to one of us, please do. And otherwise, this will be recorded, so it will be resent to you as well. If you've missed the live, hello. If you're joining us from YouTube or elsewhere, hello. Thank you so much for your time. If you've got any questions, we're running out of time, so just email me directly or give me a call and we'll go from there. 
But thanks again, everyone. I'd really appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye.